three men came back from war and wrote a book about resilience. We embarked on a literature review and our own body of research. Some of those experiences started to catch up with me a little. My interest in resilience is twofold. The first, related to ignorance. Tim Curtis and the brothers, Dan and Ben Pronk, are ex-SAS. They've done their tours of Afghanistan. They're successful in life, business, consultancies, and in Dan's case, medicine as well. He's Dr. Dan, who on another channel helps one of the SAS masochists repair self-inflicted damage. Dan, Ben and Tim have written a life manual called The Resilience Shield. Resilience, the dictionary will say it's the ability of a substance to resume its former shape after being stretched or compressed. A bit like the second Terminator. Tim Curtis goes further. In order to be resilient, you have to confront some form of adversity, and we like that. We recognise that this construct of resilience is multifactorial. There are many components to it. It's not just being physically fit, or having a close group of friends, or being great at your job. It's all of those things and more. It's dynamic, we can be more or less resilient at any particular given time. And it's modifiable that we can do something, things that improve our own resilience. But the definition has to have adversity in there. We'll have a go at our own definition shortly. Meanwhile, Tim is explaining the resilience concept to a workshop of top cops in WA. Uh, good morning. So my first career was in uniform of the camouflage variety. I did 16 years, most of that time in the SAS regiment. But there's one small caveat they'd probably approve. Four Corners, the other night, is now exposing what they're calling potential war crimes in an operating environment called Timor-Leste or East Timor that we went into in 1999. What I will say, and I'm hoping what you will embrace, is that context is important. And what's missing from this is context. Not defending it, but that's the missing ingredient. Tim Curtis also says that not all veterans have physical or mental problems. They don't all come back with PTSD. He cites the experience of Dr. Dan in Afghanistan where he lost friends he was unable to keep alive. You'd think that would affect him profoundly, and sure it did, but Dan was still able to function at an incredibly high level for multiple rotations after that in Afghanistan. And it wasn't until he'd left the service, thinking I'll leave the trauma behind, did he realise what unquestionably were the onsets of post-traumatic stress, those signs and symptoms that as a medical doctor he knew were evidence of that. Brother Ben's Afghanistan story is different. An armoured vehicle exploded in front of him. What he witnessed was three very different trajectories of response. The first, people just did exactly what they were trained to do. Predictable. The second, was people were a bit in a heap. They didn't respond well to that event. And the third, even the most peculiar, is some were euphoric as a result of this incident. And it got us thinking in this second dimension that we were all trained the same. We did the SAS selection course across a three week period. We all undertook a reinforcement cycle. We had the same weapons, the same equipment, we use the same doctrine. How could our behaviours be so different in the middle of a critical incident? One size clearly does not fit all. Hence the book's aim, to improve resilience in the field and afterwards, and to look for opportunities in adversity rather than negative aspects. Very simply, the shield consists of several layers including the body, mind, sleep, diet, and a social layer, 
the importance of a social support network. But Afghanistan is likely not to be our last battlefield. We're not seeing too many years pass by where there isn't some conflict. It might be low level, it might be more significant. Um, and unfortunately, given the diversity of our globe, the geographic challenges, the future challenges with food and water scarcity, uh, ego, power and influence, all of these subversive drivers will likely, likely require us to deploy defence personnel in complex, volatile, uncertain and ambiguous battle spaces of the future. There's a belief, and I'd probably share it to a certain extent, that we uh, decommission our ships and aircraft better than we decommission our people. But in order to decommission it, they've got to be well commissioned, which is probably an aspect of what we do in the military that's well done. However, the off-ramp isn't so great. So it's prepare them for the battlefields of the future with a view that their plan A needs to have a separate plan A that might not be in uniform that enables them to transition to something else in life where we don't see role and identity fusion. Our research in the professional layer of the Resilient Shield indicates that where there's no air gap between what's written on your business card and who you are as a person, there's a problem. When that business card is taken away, where you lose the opportunity to be a soldier or a CEO or a professional sports person, that's when we start to see certainly mental health issues and certainly physical health issues in some of those walks of life.